Welcome, Tony. Really glad to have you here today. Just wanted to Thank you, Andrew. engage in some discourse about gaming and autism with you. Um, so I guess one, one of the places I just wanted to start was in, in terms of understanding your perspective on maybe how much gaming is happening with families uh, with autistic children. Uh, a lot. Uh, for, for many reasons, computer gaming is such a thrill, psychological support, um, fascinating intellectual pursuit in autism that it is one of the few pleasures in their lives. And as far as the autistic person is concerned, why can't I do this all the time? Whereas parents are obviously concerned. Well, it's more a question of what you're missing out on, not only doing your homework, but also family activities, meals and so on. But the thing is with autism, often the person has learned how to use emotional blackmail and strategies with their parents to get what they want. They're masters at that. So it's quite a complicated area. Yeah, no doubt. I, I, I see that all the time, actually. I'd say 80% of my current client base um, is, is families with autistic gamers. And um, what, what I found, though, in, in the last eight years of work with GameAware is that there's all these fundamental motivators that we, we go into quite often um, that apply to everybody. And when it comes to autistic gamers, we sort of see um, different like trends in terms of which motivators speak the loudest. For example, mm -hmm. it might be um, relatedness, which is which is connecting to other people, for example, yeah. if that might be difficult in other settings, or um, escape, as you kind of mentioned. My own perspective is the, the reasons why an autistic person is involved in gaming, to a great extent, are similar to other individuals, but it's amplified, and there are also dimensions, in a way, that you don't have to engage in the usual socialization face to face, reading facial expressions, body language and so on. So often when you play the game, you're not autistic. It's a cure. And that can be very intoxicating for an autistic person who gets value. They're appreciated. They're popular. They're highly successful. But no one would know that they're autistic. I can totally understand that because it's it's kind of the way we we present this when we're discussing escapism with our 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 gamers and our families. Um, so there's there's a few different classes in 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 particular genres of games. So for example, Overwatch has a hero class system where uh, there's different roles, and one of the roles is DPS, which is uh, damage per second, so basically offense. And then there are tanks, which are uh, large characters with large health pools who are there to sort of absorb damage for the team in a game like mm -hmm. that. And then there's support class. And the one I'd like to talk about is healer. And the healer class will actually replenish the health pool of other players. Mm -hmm. And so the way we describe it quite regularly is that, you know, our gamer is the DPS. They're the one that has to get stuff done in their life, right? Whether that's school, homework, yeah. relationships, whatever it is, work with their family. And the common mistake, like almost every time, is that they think that games are the healer. Like you said, it feels like a cure, but the role is actually the role of a tank. It's absorbing real life damage. It's tanking damage is the way we'd say it. And so then the question becomes, right, so if games aren't the healer, then how am I actually going to replenish my health pool if gaming has gotten out of control? Because there's plenty of research that we even dive into that talks about the benefits but at some point, you play beyond the benefits and it starts becoming a problem, right? And that's it, that's the blurry line we talk about all the time. It, it is. Um, I think to a certain extent, the, the enjoyment is very intoxicating for an autistic person who has few other pleasures, certainly not interpersonal pleasures, may have limited friendship skills. And yet this has all the dopamine rushes, the enjoyment and so on which leads to the addiction is you want this again and again. Yep. And another factor is that when you're playing a game, you are suppressing your anxious thoughts or your depressive thoughts and so on. And they are compressed and suppressed. It means that when parents insist that the game is finished, switch off the computer, it's not that they've necessarily been thwarted from continuing the game. It's how on earth am I going to cope 
with a deluge of anxiety and depression that I've held back. And that may be more concern than the game is over. Absolutely. And that, that's why we, we treat it the same way, actually. So I, I always talk about um, when you're trying to manage or prevent any real problematic gaming, we got to look at it from the dual diagnosis approach. Because mm -hmm. if you if you start working on uh, just the gaming and you remove it, for example, then all the anxieties or things that are, whatever they're escaping from gets louder. But if you remove the thing that they're escaping from, you still have the gaming habit, which has become a habit over time. So what do you think then about, you know, all of the talk about the benefits of gaming? So like, I'm a big fan of pro-social gaming, for an example, of getting a group of autistic gamers together, and but doing it face to face and using the gaming as potentially um, uh, a, a vehicle for teachable moments, but also the games that you choose and the way that you you structure the session can also be super valuable in terms of building those those capacities that we're trying to build as well it's it's hard for people to accept that the answer isn't a or b black or white you know we have to look much more closely at the nuance when it comes to gaming for all of these reasons the, the individual is what matters the most but but understanding the games understanding the motivators the thing that's probably not a point of argument would be that if you're overplaying it doesn't matter what you're playing you're going to suffer the consequences with dopamine burnout, right? So even if you are finding your people and you're connecting and you're, and you have, you're ex accessing your relatedness or your social needs very well in game because you can't access them in real life. It's if you're there for six hours every day, for example, you're going to experience dopamine burnout and that's going to affect so many things, including mood or motivation yeah. and, and just general pleasure. I, I strongly endorse that. Um, th this is human physiology and psychology. <laughs> you can't keep doing that. Uh, and it's going to have a detrimental effect on your body, not only physically, but also emotionally and mentally. I think that sort of information in terms of the physiology can be explained to an autistic person, because if you are suggesting change, there must be a reason or a value to it to the autistic person themselves. That's right. And you will be a better gamer if you play this way. I feel like, at least from the esports perspective, and there are definitely, even though autonomy, as you mentioned, is really an important factor for, for autistic gamers, there's still a few autistic gamers that I've worked with that really love esports titles and getting good and mastering. And I've seen some big talent as well. Um, I feel like the grassroots esports space is actually a really important one because there's an opportunity there to not only teach healthy gaming, but but to teach about performance. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, can I take one of the sort of dimensions there? Please. For autism is wanting a sense of connection community uh, and there's a feeling that you're not isolated you're either part of a team or you're a supporter of a particular team you have a sense of identity but it's one you've chosen yourself it's not your dad's football team or something yes. like that that you follow the family tradition this is up to you that you've done uh, and that's a dimension that, that needs to be explored with the autistic person but i think that yes you need to have changes at the grassroots level to really develop this into something that is going to be beneficial rather than potentially burning out. Now, one of the things that I think you've mentioned is not today, but you mentioned in the past, is having inter-school competitions. Mm -hmm. I think that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> and, and that means that that person can then display their abilities to their peer group rather than only those who are playing the game. And if they are selected to the team to rep, it's like in the first 15 for rugby union. If you are representing the school, you're going to have status. So I think that would be a good idea. Yeah, one of the things that we've noticed, there's many reasons why starting a social gaming club and then an esports arm at a school has benefits for inclusion. It has benefits for a bit of social credit, for example, if, if especially if you're not, um, if you find you feel too vulnerable competing in physical sport, 
right? This is probably the yeah. most general way of putting it. If 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 someone's not physically inclined, let's say they love basketball, but they're very short, it means there's a lot of hard work that goes into mm -hmm. getting good. It doesn't mean you can't, but you can't teach tall, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas we don't need as many, there are still some, but we don't need as many factors when it comes to esports or just gaming yeah. in general and competence in gaming, other than just learning the game and, and practicing, but also, you know, there's still, there's still some biological factors there as well, but, but it's a lot more accessible and certainly people see it as a, as a clean slate where everybody starts on the same level, um, which definitely has some truth to it. So I can, I can see what you're saying for sure. So for example, the game aware mentors, we're not trying to be, um, therapists but we coordinate with therapists on a regular basis. So we'll work on the gaming side mm -hmm. and shine a light on where the issues are and help them become more aware of it with some motivational interviewing mm -hmm. techniques. But then we want to coordinate with an existing or the existing clinician or help them find one who is a gamer. So for example, our mate, uh, our mate, Luke, you know, having, having somebody who understands games, who is also a clinician is a very, very good mix. So yeah, I think it takes a community here, you know? It, it does. Uh, another dimension that's a characteristic of autism is an aversion to change. And, and what you're asking the person to do is change. So there's going to be a resistance to that. There's yeah. also the issue of wanting to be in control and I make my own decisions and I'm not going to surrender my autonomy to someone else to say I should reduce it. It's up to me. So there are complications associated with this. It is not an easy process at all. Yeah. Can I endorse the process that you're using of identifying a specific mentor who plays the game? That mm -hmm. means they speak the same language. They've experienced the same feeling. So in other words, they have credibility. So when they talk, the autistic person will listen. Otherwise they will say, you've never played this game. You don't know what it's about. Why should I seek your advice and accept your advice when you don't know what you're talking about. So credibility is very, very important for an autistic person. You share the same experiences and language, therefore I'm listening. So interesting question then. It's good for the accepting the advice, right? And this is certainly our model. But when it comes time to work with a clinician, if the clinician is somebody they've already been engaged with, they've got a relationship with, they're not necessarily getting that far because the clinician doesn't understand gaming. And then someone else comes in, shines a light on where the issues with the gaming are uh, and where their benefits are, and then they have that connection. Do you think that in this two-step or this two, this double-sided approach, kind of the, what I talked about with the dual diagnosis at the same time, that the mentor can then prime the young gamer to work with the clinician on the things that they're escaping from and sort of compartmentalize? Yeah, I think it's working as a team. It, it's combining knowledge of games and knowledge of clinical psychology, emotions and autism and so on. If you combine, you're far more powerful. I think what needs to be recognized by psychologists and psychiatrists too is to appreciate the value of the mentor because they have expertise that is incredibly valuable in formulating a plan. And without that person, the psychologist's effectiveness is going to be significantly reduced. But together, then they can work as a team, which is going to be far more effective. I love that you said that. We're, I always say we're trying to, I mean, it's probably a dramatic term, but we're trying to facilitate epiphanies. <laughs> You know, or realis or realizations <laughs> for our young gamers by showing them from their perspective. Um, yeah, I, I particularly like your choice of word of an epiphany, yeah. uh, and that's what's going to work. But it, it is something that has been created within the autistic person themselves. It's not obedience. Right. It's basically you've discovered it. Wow, I recognize that. What you mean now? It's a revelation, an epiphany, and therefore you're going to look at significant changes. So you're you're trying to facilitate that moment. Any closing remarks or anything? Uh, no, it's a delight. I'm, I'm glad, Andrew, that you are doing what you're doing. It is very much needed, and I'm delighted to be able to contribute to your overall vision, but also practically. I really appreciate you for coming in, Tony.